and he had been in 26 countries in 18 months and said that looking at the number of species that have gone extinct, the, um, the areas of land that no longer support life, uh, dead spots in the ocean, destroyed rivers, that his best estimate is that 40% of the planet no longer supports life, God. that 40% of the planet is dead, and that another decade of this level of destruction will tip the balance into an, an, a non-sustainable environment. In 1990, um, Congress was passing the Clean Air Act, and the part of the bill that dealt with ozone uh, said we would have a, by the year 2000, we would phase out the worst ozone destroyers. And I called, I was in Washington at the time, I called the chief lobbyist for one of the environmental organizations, and I called a staff member on the, the House committee that was dealing with the bill, and I said, how did you come up with the year 2000? You know, we should have stopped in 1974. And they both gave me the same answer. They said the year 2000 allows DuPont to recover their investments. Uh, and so that's DuPont's how health policy is more important than the survival of life, of on, the the life on the planet. Ozone depletion, global warming, destruction of the rainforest, and political machinations. These are the subjects of alternative views. We're extremely pleased to have with us today on Alternative Views our old friend Lanny Sinkin. Many years ago, Lanny was involved in the South Texas cancellation campaign that attempted to block the South Texas nuclear project, and we did a program with him at that time. Since then, Lanny has left Texas. He's been involved with the Christic Institute in Washington for some years and is now an independent writer and reporter. Today we're going to do a program with him on the threat to our environment from ozone depletion. As we're taping this program today, the Earth Summit is going on in Brazil, and ecologists are talking about the desperate need to save our sick, fragile planet from environmental destruction. And we're going to talk about this issue today with Lanny Sinkin. Lanny, we see that uh, there are so many heads of state at this Earth Summit in Brazil. It seems like an incredible amount of importance being placed on this. Why suddenly, do you think, have the big countries and the Western capitalist countries suddenly become environmentalists? Well, I think they're waking up to reality. Um, there's a UN scientist named Rashmi Mayur, and I had a chance to listen to him be interviewed in <coughs> Portland, Oregon recently. And he had been in 26 countries in 18 months and said that looking at the number of species that have gone extinct, the, um, the areas of land that no longer support life, uh, dead spots in the ocean, destroyed rivers, that his best estimate is that 40% of the planet no longer supports life, God. that 40% of the planet is dead, and that another decade of this level of destruction will tip the balance into an, an, a non-sustainable environment in which not all species will disappear and life will continue on this planet. It's been here for billions of years and will go on. But life as we know it and civilization as we know it will no longer exist. And I think that message has penetrated uh, from the grassroots upward as people have seen their own environments destroyed and decayed and that it is forcing world leaders to deal with the issue. We unfortunately are the, the nation that is the biggest obstruction to dealing with the yeah. issue. Uh, George Bush is the biggest obstruction in the policies that he foments. Uh, he did the same thing with the Earth Summit that he did with the ozone depletion issue. Uh, back in 1990, there was a proposal to create a very modest $325 million fund so that 
developing countries could move into refrigeration without using the CFCs, the DuPont products for refrigeration. And Bush refused to agree to contribute from the United States $125 million, you know, one, one wing of a B-2 airplane probably, if, if not less. Um, until the last minute when they held the international meeting on ozone, he gave up and said, okay, we'll contribute to this international fund, but use the withdrawal, the, the withholding of that till the last minute as leverage to put a phase out on ozone destroying chemicals well into the future to protect DuPont's investments and the other companies, Penwalt, and all the others that are producing these chemicals. Uh, he obstructed a consensus being reached so that they could move well out into the future the continued production and use of these chemicals. He's done the same thing with the Earth Summit. There was a, a fairly strong treaty on greenhouse warming gases, and the United States simply refused to sign, refused to participate, until they watered that treaty down to the point that it has no firm timetables for phasing down the greenhouse gas emission levels. Uh, it, it was basically neutered uh, as a treaty, but he's going down there now to sign that and give himself a patina of being <laughs> the environmental president. Um, but a lot of the other countries in the world, a lot of the world leaders are taking the problem far more seriously uh, than we are. Uh, everything from the, the Netherlands is cutting their, their cow herd in half because uh, cow flatulence is a greenhouse gas. Methane gas is a greenhouse gas. Uh, so they're cutting their, their cattle herds in half to reduce the amount of their contribution to greenhouse gases. Countries all over the world are responding like that. Uh, we, unfortunately, don't have the kind of leadership in this country that, that is willing to recognize the problem. And I think the ozone depletion issue that we're going to talk about today is, is one where they clearly showed that even a threat to the very existence of life on the planet wasn't enough for them to go against the corporate sponsors who put them in office and keep them in office. Lanny, let's uh, focus on this issue that I know you've been doing a lot of research on, on the ozone depletion problem. First of all, I think we need to talk about the magnitude of the problem. How serious is this, really? And then we'll get into some of the science of it. What is ozone? How is it being depleted? And then what is causing this? And then what is what can we do about this politically? What will be the response? So that'll be the agenda for today. Okay. Um, one of our difficulties is we don't really even know how serious the ozone depletion problem is. We know it's very serious. We don't know ultimately how serious. The uh, original data that started coming in in the early 80s found a reduction of up to 45% of the ozone over the South Pole. And that was considered a very unusual circumstance that was because of uh, certain wind patterns that concentrated and held those pollutants over the South Pole, leading to far greater destruction than happened in the rest of the planet. Well, that's no longer true. In uh, 1992, in April of 1992, the Russian uh, observatories were reporting 25 to 40 percent reduction of ozone levels over middle latitudes of the northern hemisphere. Uh, we now have evidence of ozone depletion over the equator uh, from the most recent satellite that NASA sent up. Uh, the equator is where more ozone is produced than anywhere else on the planet. So that this region should be experiencing declining ozone is a great big warning flag for the rest of the planet. In terms of how serious it is, the, the loss of ozone means greater penetration of ultraviolet light to the planet's surface. Ultraviolet light <coughs> can cause crops to fail or destroy them altogether. They either don't mature or they are destroyed. And some of our key crops, uh, sorghum, things like that, are very uh, sensitive to increased ultraviolet light. In human beings, it causes cataracts, retinal damage, skin cancers, uh, in areas of the planet that have been under the ozone hole, what we call a hole is about 40% reduction level. <clears throat> Australia, everyone over 50 has had skin cancer now. Uh, that's the level of damage we're seeing in the human species. There are now blind rabbits and blind salmon in Patagonia in South America being found because of the ultraviolet penetration. The worst case scenario we released since 1974 5 billion pounds of ozone destroying chemicals that are working their way up to the atmosphere. Once they get up there, they can destroy ozone for 50 to 100 years. Uh, worst case scenario, we've released enough to thin the ozone layer to the point that it dissolves <coughs> and the planet fries. Uh, that's the worst case scenario. We trust that that is not a statistically significant 
probability. That's very, I think it's very uh, significant to talk about that because uh, I've seen uh, um, an astronomer or two who say that unlike what most people say and that, well, we may mess up the planet, but in a few years, decades, hundreds of years, thousands, maybe millions of years, the Earth will regenerate itself. However, some of the astronomers are saying that, no, there, we could tip the balance too far and, like you say, destroy you could the produce, air, uh, and Venus. the United States could become, I mean, the, the Earth could become like Venus forever. That's right. We, we could do that. It is possible. Uh, the Earth has many apparently self-regulating mechanisms. I mean, it, the, just the very existence of the ozone layer itself is at least an argument for some higher consciousness on the planet in many ways. Because what it does, if we can get into the science of ozone, right. you've got basically a, a molecule composed of three oxygen atoms. It's a very simple molecule. It's three oxygen atoms joined together, and it's called ozone. When ultraviolet light enters the atmosphere and strikes an ozone molecule, one of those oxygen atoms breaks off. The, uh, the molecule absorbs the energy of the ultraviolet light. The oxygen atom breaks off, leaving the other two oxygens, and a small amount of energy is emitted to the stratosphere and warms the stratosphere. Then that single oxygen atom wanders around until it finds a pair of oxygen atoms and recombines to create ozone again. Hmm. So it's a, it's a constantly absorbing, recreating system that prevents ultraviolet light from reaching the planetary surface where it could do a lot of harm. And yet it filters through the sunlight to give the heat and energy for life. The sunlight we need for photosynthesis grow. comes right. right through. Okay. So that, we've, that the planet has somehow developed this exquisite mechanism for allowing the solar ecosystem to thrive and be protected at the same time on the planetary surface. And this is the only planet that at least we know that has this process in our protection by our solar, system. In in our our solar, solar system. system. This is the only one that has a, 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 a balance that's been reached where life as we know it can thrive. So life itself is dependent on ozone. This is not something that's of secondary importance yeah, no, to the human species. No, it's a primary protector. Okay. It's definitely a primary protector. Now, what is it that actually destroys the ozone? What kinds of pollutants or chemicals or processes? The, the, and what happens when in this process of destruction? The chemicals containing chlorine and bromine are the two greatest ozone destroyers. And it really goes back to the chlorofluorocarbons, the CFCs, which when they were <coughs> first invented were thought to be a miracle chemical because they were so stable. They didn't seem to interact with anything. So that you could use them in a refrigeration process and they would remain CFCs forever and just keep expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting, and you'd have the refrigeration. Um, when they washed over uh, computer chips, they took off the impurities and floated them off into the atmosphere and just carried them away because they didn't interact with anything in the atmosphere. And so we thought, Eureka, we've got this miracle chemical. <clears throat> well, back in 1974, a scientist named Mario Molina, working with a second scientist named Sherwood Rowland, asked the question, where do they go? I mean, they've got to end up somewhere. So he looked at what was going on in the atmosphere and figured out that these CFCs were actually going all the way up to the stratosphere and going above the ozone layer. And when he looked at what would be happening up there, he realized that ultraviolet C, which is one of the wavelengths of ultraviolet light that comes from the sun, would cause the, the chlorofluorocarbon to split, much as the ozone is split by ultraviolet B. The chlorofluorocarbon is split by ultraviolet C, and the little chlorine atom comes out. And what that chlorine atom is 5,000 5, times more likely to do than anything else is find an ozone molecule and take one of the oxygen, oxygen atoms away, leaving the other two paired oxygen. And it forms chlorine monoxide, one chlorine, one oxygen. Then that wanders around in the stratosphere and finds another chlorine monoxide. They interact to combine the two oxygen mo uh, atoms into one molecule and release the two chlorine atoms as single chlorines that then go find another ozone and take away an oxygen <coughs> and keep that process going. So what we're doing is, with the chlorine and the bromine chemicals, once they photo dissociate in ultraviolet C, break apart, and the chlorine is free and the bromine is free, they are one CFC molecule that reaches the stratosphere. The chlorine coming out of it can destroy 100,000 ozone molecules.
before it's finally locked up in another compound and the chlorine stops destroying ozone. Somewhat similar to cancer in the human body then. Uh, in a way. Very virulent form of, of cancer, a free radical in the body that can go around and cause a tremendous amount of damage. So in 74, Roland and Molina published a paper saying this is what we think is happening with the CFCs. And DuPont went nuts. Uh, <laughs> yeah. By then it was a two billion dollar business. Uh, and mainly it was uh, the aerosol cans where the CFC was a propellant for deodorant, paint, whatever being sprayed through the air. The propellant industry, DuPont and Penwalt and the other producers, started a major campaign to say this is just theory. This is just a scientist saying, you know, that this is happening. There's no reason that we can't have CFCs and a, a, an ozone layer. They took out a full-page ad in the New York Times in 1975. They went before Congress in 1975 and testified that if it was found that uh, chlorofluorocarbons mm -hmm. were harmful to health, they'd stop producing them. They promised in 1975. They haven't stopped yet. Um, well, th that counterattack by industry on the scientists was very disturbing for the scientists. You read their history of that time. I mean, they, they thought they were just explaining, you know, what was happening. And suddenly they became the center of this massive controversy and were being attacked as, uh, you know, sort of radical environmentalists, probably, <laughs> in their day. Or doomsayers. Or, do doomsayers or yeah. whatever. Environmental extremists, that's the buzzword. Uh, well, the, the, one, that, uses the one you will see coming along stronger now is eco-terrorists. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, right. <laughs> that's already been used uh, against Earth First people and will be used more yeah. in, the, in the coming months as we near the 1992 elections. I predict we will hear more of that term. Um, the DuPont counterattack slowed down the response somewhat to this problem. But in 1977, the state of Oregon became the first state to ban CFCs in aerosols. Mm -hmm. And in 1978, Congress followed suit. And, and in a sense, we thought, there, we, we fixed that problem. We banned it in aerosols. And in, in one sense, we had. The issue had been made public, it had been examined, there was a public consensus, a law was passed, and we were done with it. Behind our backs, DuPont and Penwalt and Allied Signal marketed that product to the computer industry for cleaning the chips and to the refrigeration industry for going inside cooling systems like crazy, knowing what the scientists were saying and knowing that a public consensus had been reached that we didn't want this to happen. They went ahead and marketed that product anyway. Now, how could and they it, do this if it had already been banned? It wasn't banned in all aerosols. You, you still, if you today, those honking horns people take to basketball games and things, oh, they can still use it. Those should, be, those should not be allowed. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, that's what they did. They did market it, and, it, and there was a tremendous drop-off in the use of these chemicals after the ban on aerosols. But by 1988, with their aggressive marketing, we were back producing at a level equal to the level it was before we banned it in aerosols. And with the Reagan administration uh, and this the process of deregulation, yeah. all of these restrictions and environmental constraints went out the window. Well, the Secretary of the Interior in the Reagan administration said that it was a, really not a problem. People just simply had to get sunglasses and wear sunscreen and uh -huh. it would all go away. It, it didn't explain how the plants would put on sunscreen or how the fish or the rabbits would wear sunglasses, uh, but that was their approach to the problem. Well, what about exports and foreign production? That wasn't uh, affected we, by this. They moved it like crazy into the international market, and the ban on aerosols here was not followed by all countries. There were still countries using it in aerosols. That has tended to stop. Uh, there has been a, an international agreement on phasing out ozone-destroying chemicals, but every time they reach an agreement and pick a year, New data comes within a year that says that's totally inadequate. Uh, as I said, we, when we first started talking about the hole in the ozone, that was a 40% reduction over the South Pole. We thought, this is terrible. Uh, then it's now cascading down over the other latitudes of the planet. We should stop yesterday any further production, distribution, use, emission of these chemicals. And it's not just CFCs. It's methyl chloroform. It's carbon tetrachloride. Uh, they're used in a lot of different industries. We know who's using it. You can write to EPA and get a list of every company in your state that's using ozone-destroying chemicals and emitting them into the air. Uh, we did that up in Oregon, and I started calling them and asking them how they were doing and getting out of it. And a lot of them are working very hard to get out of it or have gotten out of it. So we can survive without these chemicals that Absolutely. are destroying the <laughs> pollution. I mean, they're recent, relatively recent 
you know, we we survived for billions of years without, without them. them. And what we found is a lot of the companies feeling the pressure, the right. public pressure, not to be associated as an ozone destroyer, right. went and developed their own processes, Whether developed their own solvents, or, develop, or changed yeah. their whole manufacturing process so it wasn't necessary anymore. One company said, well, we found out if we didn't get it dirty, we didn't have to clean it. So we just created a, a cleaner room so it didn't get dirty and we didn't need the solvent. So it's greed and sloth that basically keeps this process going. <clears throat> greed, uber alt, right. greed is it. Right. I mean, the, in 1990, um, Congress was passing the Clean Air Act. And the part of the bill that dealt with ozone uh, said we would have a, by the year 2000, we would phase out the worst ozone destroyers. And I called, I was in Washington at the time, I called the chief lobbyist for one of the environmental organizations, and I called a staff member on the, the House committee that was dealing with the bill, and I said, how did you come up with the year 2000? You know, we should have stopped in 1974. And they both gave me the same answer. They said the year 2000 allows DuPont to recover their investments. As so that's how health policy is more important than the survival, survival of life of on the, the planet. Life on the planet. Of that's right. And of course it is. I mean, look who's running the system, the well, capitalism. This is that's what I say about George Bush yeah. and his corporate sponsors. As long yeah. as that thinking and that way of dealing with the planet is running the planet, we'll all be at risk. Let uh, me ask you this. I've seen, uh, I saw an article once where it said that the ozone was thin above Austin because of all the fluorocarbons, et cetera, being used in the computer chip industry. And the same thing has happened in, in certain other cities. Is this really true, where just above certain cities or areas, the, uh, oh, is there be a, a weakness or we are, a thinness in the we're ozone? Finding, we're finding isolated pockets. Now, I hadn't heard it above Austin, but I had heard it over Canada. They found a pocket of dramatically reduced ozone and attributed it to a, a one concentration of particles that came out of the Pinatubo volcano having come up into the stratosphere in that area mm -hmm. and provided a, a surface medium for chemical reactions that accelerated ozone depletion. This is, this is what we had been seeing at the South Pole and what certain scientists had predicted would happen with the particles from Pinatubo. Also, so it the can happen. oil fires had also uh, caused... We, uh, we know they put particulates in the air. It's not clear yet whether they're interacting with the ozone. I mean, it, it, this is all interrelated and extremely complex. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that ozone-destroying chemicals, particularly CFCs, are one of the most effective greenhouse gases. CFCs can hold heat 15,000 times more effective than carbon dioxide. That, I think so it, it heats 15, up or the climate then. It's, it's not only and heating the climate. changes the basic environmental Changes pattern. the ozone pattern, right. allows the ultraviolet in. We're now looking at the uh, equ equatorial destruction of ozone, trying to figure out it's not just Pinatubo. There's something else going on there, but Pinatubo particles is part of it. What may be going on is that you have greenhouse warming going on in a differential way on the planet. The equatorial region is heating faster. The Ice Age theories that have been put forward about how the Ice Age is preceded by greenhouse effect. The equatorial region heats faster so that the air is rising more rapidly and in greater volumes in the equatorial region, which may be drawing in the CFCs and other ozone destroyers from other parts of the planet to the equatorial region and lifting them up like a vacuum cleaner with that accelerated warming and spewing them into the stratosphere so that we're seeing d ozone destruction around the equator because of this accelerated greenhouse warming effect. These things are all interrelated and as I say very complex. So trying to do a computer model of climatology is, is asking for a headache. We had a documentary called, uh, I think it was Stopping the Coming Ice Age or something mm -hmm. like that, in which it said that the greenhouse effect and the global warming could in fact trigger an ice age and trigger it very quickly. John Hamaker is a mechanical engineer trained at Purdue University who has been studying climate from a very multidisciplinary perspective for the past 15 years. Hamaker believes the energy to build up the ice age glaciers comes from a greenhouse effect. Northern Hemisphere winters have been colder during many of the last 15 years than in all of recorded history. Florida citrus crops used to freeze about one year every decade. They froze four of the five years from 1980 to 85. New records have been broken over and over again almost every winter in the past few years. John Hemmaker points out that the greenhouse effect has to occur most strongly in the tropics since that is the area which already gets the most sunlight. The poles in higher latitudes which get relatively few of the sun's rays 
they're even dark much of the year, should be warmed very little by a greenhouse effect. When the tropics heat up and the poles don't change much, the temperature difference between these two areas of the globe increases. And when that occurs, any meteorologist can tell you what will happen. It might very well be that the number of hurricanes would increase, and the number of tornadoes, not only will they increase, but the intensities might be greater. As the greenhouse effect heats up the already warm tropical oceans, additional water is evaporated, which forms more clouds. Some of this extra moisture gets picked up by the increasing wind systems that have developed and is moved far away. Hamaker believes that this process is responsible for the excessive rainfall the northern hemisphere seems to be experiencing in the last 10 to 15 years, which has caused some rivers to flood severely and that this increased rainfall is what has caused some lakes to rise to record levels in recent years. As some of the new moisture-laden clouds are driven to high latitude and polar regions, they precipitate out as snow and ice, building up the polar glaciers. The average northern hemisphere snow cover increased enormously from 1967 to 1975. Since then, the area covered by spring snow cover has again reached record levels, freezing newly planted crops and turning millions of peaches and other fruit into ice cubes. Some scientists now believe that simply by producing more clouds that block the sun, a greenhouse effect makes the earth colder rather than warmer. Others believe that a sustained increase in cloudiness, whatever its source, could lead to an ice age. Many scientists besides Hamaker now believe that a greenhouse effect paradoxically is likely to lead to increased snow cover and the buildup of polar ice. The moisture is carried over regions that used to receive rain, and they become deserts. It floods northern regions, and it drops more snow and ice on the polar caps. You also have an acceleration of the cold air coming down underneath the warm air. So the cold air moves further south. You have failures of the winter wheat crop, which we've seen three or four years in a row now. And you have uh, declining plant growth, so that the whole process starts accelerating. As you build up snow and ice on the polar caps, you increase pressure on the tectonic plates, which can cause more volcanic activity, which creates more greenhouse gases, accelerates the process still further. So in, in this theory, I know that John Hamaker was the scientist that worked out this theory. He believes that the greenhouse warming effect is in fact the precursor to the ice age the effect. Trigger of it kind and of that we can stop it mm -hmm. by right. remineralizing the soil, creating a, a, a nutrient base, and planting billions of trees to eat the CO2 out of the air and provide for a stabilizing of the, the climate so that we don't get into this cycle that leads to the ice age. Here is a drawing of the whole system, the engine of the ice ages, as proposed by John Hamaker. It starts with the demineralization of much of the world's soils by erosion and leaching, particularly in the temperate regions. When soils lose their minerals, the forests growing on them become weakened and they consume less carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Then as they die and sometimes catch fire and burn, their carbon is released back to the atmosphere in ever greater quantities. This excess carbon dioxide creates a greenhouse effect. If a greenhouse effect, driven by the gradual loss of soil minerals and the consequent decline of the Earth's vegetation, is in fact the long-sought engine of the ice ages, we may have it within our power not only to slow down the process, but to stop the cycle of ice ages completely. How? By doing a number of things very quickly. Stopping the clear-cutting of the Earth's forests, greatly reducing our fossil fuel burning, planting vast quantities of new trees to consume the excess carbon dioxide, and by taking over what seems to be the glacier's job 
and remineralizing much of the earth's soil ourselves. Many of the earth's temperate region forests are dying. And the idea that we would even cut down another tree on the planet today is, is something that still hasn't penetrated to people. We should not even think about it. Lanny, how does destruction of the rainforest fit into this? It's being destroyed at such a great rate, and we're always told that trees are the good, good, good people help protecting us from all these awful right. things we've been talking about. What is going to be the effect of the destruction at the ra of the rainforest at the present rate? Well, the, the rainforests, both in uh, Latin America and in the United States, are being destroyed. I mean, we, we keep pointing the finger at the Amazon. We're destroying our own rainforests. The tropical rainforests contain the most concentrated, rapidly growing vegetation on Earth. And we've been cutting them down at an ever-accelerating rate. The Amazon Basin in Brazil is the largest of the remaining rainforests on Earth. An area of Amazon rainforest the size of France is being clear-cut every five years the equivalent of a football field every second. The rainforest is, in, is incredibly important to the planet in a number of ways. One, it's basically the lungs of the planet. That's where oxygen is coming from for the atmosphere in huge quantities from the rainforest. Secondly, the diversity of species that exist in the rainforest are categorically beyond any other ecosystem we have on the planet, the incredible number of species. We haven't even begun to calculate them all. And out of that diversity, we find plants um, that are medicinally useful, uh, important to human health, and, and things we haven't even begun to discover are there. The more that's cut down for cattle grazing or uh, just simply populations moving out of urban areas trying to homestead, uh, the more we're destroying our own ability to sustain life on the planet, and the more we're losing this invaluable resource for the future that we have just begun to understand. Uh, we have to help with economic policies that discourage that kind of development. Through the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, we have been encouraging just that kind of thing to happen. And we have to change those policies so that people are encouraged to preserve their rainforests and to allow the indigenous people in the rainforest who know how to live in a sustainable way with the rainforest to continue to to be the stewards of the rainforest and, and limit the intrusions by the rubber tappers and the gold miners and the others. That can be done in sustainable ways to an extent, but it really is intrusive. The uh, indigenous people know how to live in the rainforest in a way that the rainforest will be there thousands of years from now. There's, there's another factor here. Uh, Daniel Lanis in, of the Austin Peace and Justice uh, Coalition had an article recently where he indicated that the space shuttle is also one yeah. of the causes of the ozone depletion and Star Wars types of research. According to Daniel, every time the space shuttle goes up, thousands of pounds of pollutants enter the air, including chlorine acid gas that goes into the atmosphere every time a shuttle takes off, as if the plumes of smoke that you see are billions of molecular Pac-Men eating up the uh, precious uh, ozone layer. It's even been estimated by scientists that the space shuttle has destroyed 10% of the available ozone. Have you heard these the, accounts? This and is what? a very serious problem that they are, they again are trying to minimize and sweep under the rug. You listen to the NASA scientists and they say, oh, the percentage of destruction of ozone by the shuttle is so tiny it doesn't count. Well, Only 1%, they say, which to me sounds like a lot. Well, given, <laughs> if you keep this figure uh, in mind, this is a, a standard calculation. Yeah. A 1% decline in the ozone layer at the stratospheric level leads to a 2% increase in ultraviolet penetration to the planetary surface leads to a 4% increase in skin cancer. So each 1% we decrease... It's an decrease, exponential it, it, increase. It's right? exponential. When you're talking right. about a 20% increase or decline, 20% decline in ozone, you're talking about a 40% increase in ultraviolet and you're talking about an 80% increase in skin cancer. So every 1% means thousands of people getting potentially deadly melanomas and dying. So it's not insignificant at all. And this is also related to uh, the military. The military is one of the key reasons that ozone is continuing to be destroyed in, on the planet because they have put into their specifications for their contractors a requirement to use these chemicals and have been extremely slow 
to change those specifications. A lot of pressure is being put on them. But a lot of the companies we talked to when we were surveying corporations in Oregon were saying, well, we've had trouble because we have military contracts and the military requires us to use CFCs to clean the chips or requires us to use methyl chloroform or whatever it is. And until they, we either have to give up the contract or get them to change the specifications. And they're very slow about it. We hope they're going to do it soon. Well, it's not an accident that the death-worshipping culture that produced the military and militarized the space program should be responsible for destroying the ozone layer. I mean, to me, it's spiritually coherent that they would do as much as possible to destroy life on the planet. Well, the Gulf War was one of the great acts of environmental terrorism, just the war itself. The war itself. Destroying the environment of Kuwait and Iraq, just simply with all the bombs yes. that were dropped on the surface yes. of the earth, to say nothing of the pollution of the Persian Gulf uh, with the oil spills, and which were caused both by the Iraqis and U.S., bombing and then the US was bombing nuclear chemical and biological weapons plants yeah I, I again contaminating didn't quite understand the rationale for bombing a, a, a biological weapons plant so hoping again, they'd get out uh, you know it didn't make a lot of sense one, one of the lessons of the Gulf War is that war is environmental terrorism oh yes in the modern age and it's just not clear that the earth can tolerate such brutal assaults well one of the most uh, modern weapons dramatic systems chemical warfare scenarios we've seen recently was Vietnam when we went in there with the defoliants and napalm mm -hmm. and, and uh, Agent, Orange. Agent Orange all of that and left behind a, a biological time bomb that's still ticking still children being born with terrible deformities in Vietnam areas where crops don't grow I mean all of that that should have that should have told us the whole lesson I think Vietnam told us a lot of the lessons and uh, you know a lot of people still don't get it Lanny can we get back to the Earth Summit again. <coughs> sure. I read an article that uh, was quite critical of the Earth Summit. They said, yes, it's time for the people of the Earth to take this problem seriously. But they said that most of the proposals are, w would result in leaving the control and management of this basically up to corporations rather than the government force. And the corporations are the ones who were, were the pr responsible for this in the yeah. first place. There's a, there's a, national, international organization of corporations forming to deal with responsible environmental policy. And it's Dow Chemical and, you know, all our the favorite usual suspects. usual suspects, round up the usual suspects, and they are going to tell us how to be responsible. <clears throat> what, um, a number of things. One is people need to keep in mind that a corporation is a fictional entity. We create them. We, we do a piece of paper, three people sign it, you register it with a secretary of state somewhere, and suddenly you've created a corporation. It does not exist. It is a fictional entity. It only moves because people are part of it. The second thing is the corporation has no morality, has no values. It is a servant to the shareholders, the managers, and the employees of the corporation. As long as the shareholders and the managers and the employees are strictly run by getting the most money out of that corporation, that corporation will, will continue to be incredibly efficient at destroying the planet. It doesn't matter whether it's Japanese or European or Eastern European or United States. The corporations are devouring the planet to produce wealth to be given to their owners. It's like this blind worm moving through the planet. The idea that those corporations operating through that mentality could establish a biologically sustainable economic system for the planet is ludicrous. It goes completely contrary to their very nature. They don't even understand the concept of sustainability. Sustainability is going to come about because people realize that the corporations represent a threat to their continued existence. That the corporations are such blind animals that they will blunder ahead and destroy the ability of people to survive on the planet because they're, they're just these juggernauts rolling along. The corporations basically understand profit. They see in this environmental issue as a threat to profitability and so basically then they respond in a way to minimize the threat to their profits in terms of the environmental 
uh, environmental policies that they do. In other words, they'll make a minimum amount of concessions that will yes. save them a maximum amount of money to try to deal with the problem, not because they're concerned with the environment, with actually making a contribution to the sustainability of life, but simply to minimize the threats to their profits. That's Absolutely. all they care that, about. Sure, That's they'll the get way a, it works. a green seal that makes them look like, you know, now they're green. Okay, right. so suddenly Dow Chemical's green. Uh, I would, I would modify the analysis a little bit because if we look at the last 40 years, in many ways it didn't matter whether we were looking at socialist governments or capitalist governments. They were same, both were making the same mistake. They were devouring the earth to deliver the goods to their clan. Well, the socialist uh, countries were just a big corporation, you know, a state corporation, state corporation that was governed by some of the same imperatives of delivering the goods, profitability, right. for power, etc. And the real challenge that has arisen, what what the ecological paradigm presents as a challenge is that it's not about how you distribute the wealth you create. You have to step back one step and say, how do you create wealth? If you are creating wealth in a non-sustainable way so that you're destroying the planet to create wealth, it won't matter if you distribute it equitably to everybody. That'll be the last generation that gets anything. So if you're talking about sustainability over the long term, you have to ask, how do we create wealth? And if we want to create wealth, how can we create it in a sustainable way? And that means changing the way we live on the planet. That's the fundamental challenge that really terrifies the Bush group, the, the DuPonts, the Dow Chemicals and all that. They know that their way of living on the planet has to go. And that those who raise this concern about the ecology of the planet and raise the environmental movement and all that, uh, or talk spiritually about Gaia, I mean, they see the threat coming from all levels, are presenting the fundamental challenge that they will have to do their best to either co-opt, which they're finding out does not work, or destroy. And I think that's where they are headed now. They'll do their best to make the Earth Summit a meaningless experience, take credit for whatever they can take credit for, but then they will turn their attention to doing what they can to uh, destabilize, disempower, and ultimately destroy this very powerful environmental consciousness that is rising up on the planet. So what can we do to prevent the destruction of the earth, ozone depletion? Let's just start with that. How can we reverse this process of ozone depletion? Well, there, Where does it begin? There, there are really a number of levels we have to operate at. At the individual level, first of all, it's important to keep in mind there will be destruction. There will be injury. We've done that. There's five billion pounds working their way up there. So you need to take steps to protect your eyes. You need to get sunglasses that are UV screening and be sure that they are. We're now getting false claims made. I mean, it's, you know, somehow people feel they can market a pair of sunglasses and claim they're UVB screening and they're not. So double check them. Uh, find sunscreens that are as natural as possible. Uh, take care of the children. Uh, it's very distressing to me to see um, in Oregon where we're having far greater depletion than you are in Austin. Uh, young children with fair skin, fair hair, walking the streets, no sunglasses, no hats, no body protection, because their parents don't know. The public health sector in the United States has completely fallen on its face and failed to alert people to what is potentially an epidemic of skin cancers, cataracts, retinal damage. Which we've had in Australia, so we Which have Aust evidence we have, we can <coughs> see that this Absolutely. is the effect this of is ozone the effect. depletion, right? Um, so self-protection, protection of family through clothing, sunscreen, uh, hats, sunglasses, ultraviolet B screening sunglasses, that's step one. Step two is cleaning up our act in terms of uh, not using these chemicals anymore in either our homes or our workplace. Uh, don't buy anything that has a, a warning label that's saying it, it may be destructive of ozone or if it has methyl chloroform in it or carbon tetrachloride, just don't buy it. If you go into a store, there are still stores, uh, Walmarts, Kmarts, stores like that that are marketing the little cans to recharge air conditioners in automobiles. Those are CFC cans. And when you recharge the air conditioner, you're probably recharging it because it leaks now. So you're already putting CFCs into the atmosphere. When you finish, the can probably contains anywhere from 1 to 10 percent of the original material still in the can. When you throw it in the trash can, that leaks out into the atmosphere. Uh, it's totally irresponsible that these corporations are still marketing the product, but it's equally irresponsible that people buy and use them. Uh, ideally, we'd reach the point where people drive their car in somewhere and all the CFCs are simply vacuumed out and stored somewhere until we can figure out how to destroy them safely. Uh, that's not going to happen under a Bush administration, so 
it'll be a while before we see that. Does that mean that uh, you buy anything in a store and anything that has a uh, uh, propellant on no, it? No, most, most of the propellant items now, there are non-ozone destroying substitutes that have come in. And how can you tell there's a label that says? And on some products, they, have, they will label that the, <coughs> the chemical in this product can be harmful to the ozone layer. If you see that don't label on there, just don't even get it. But there are some others that, that, that don't, don't have that label. Don't label it. And how can you tell and just by reading some of the big, you, big, big names, look, big words? And methyl chloroform or chlorofluorocarbon or Freon, which is DuPont's uh, product name. Uh, carbon tetrachloride, if you see any of those names in the product, don't buy it. And I think it's, it's worth mentioning um, that DuPont, in 1981, stopped research into alternative chemicals that were non-ozone destroying but oh would do the same God. job, and stopped it for five years. To the, the level of irresponsibility of the DuPont Corporation is hard to measure. Arrogance, but they, it, arrogance uh, greed, whatever it was, uh, they have persisted in a policy that long after all the evidence was in saying that they, they, indeed there were health effects and it should be stopped. But anyway, personal level, product level, <clears throat> we need legislation. There are many excellent ordinances that have been passed in cities from Irvine, California, uh, has done a very tight ordinance, a number of other cities uh, that have simply banned the use of products produced with CFCs like styrofoams, uh, the emissions of CFCs and other ozone destroying chemicals. Uh, there's no reason now that EPA shouldn't step forward and ban ozone-destroying chemicals, period. They should have done it 20 years ago. They didn't. They've allowed it to go on. They should do it now. Uh, so people can <clears throat> urge their legislator to, to urge EPA to do it, or the Congress can pass a law. They can change the Clean Air Act and say, okay, no more, period. I mean, even under the current Clean Air Act, we got the data from NASA in February of 92 that was so disturbing. Uh, levels of chlorine monoxide, that chlorine and oxygen molecule where they combine and then they release the chlorines. The levels of chlorine monoxide in the northern hemisphere were 50% higher than anything we'd ever measured anywhere on the planet, including the South Pole. And it was just terror in the scientific community over what this would mean. Somehow we lucked out, the temperature in the atmosphere, whatever. We got through 92 without seeing the kind of destruction we thought we were going to see. But they moved the phase-out year from 2000 to 1995. But that's phase out of the worst chemicals, not all of them, just the ones that are most destructive. There's a second generation HCFCs that are less destructive, and DuPont produces those too. Well, we ought to just say, ya basta, that's it, no more. Pass a law banning the production, distribution, use, and emission of any ozone-destroying chemical and, and help corporations get through it that need to get through it. Lots of corporations have already gotten through it, and they can help others get through and out of using these chemicals if they form some kind of uh, coordinated information sharing. You know, set up a computer conference. You know, PeaceNet would be happy to help them, I'm sure. Set up a computer <laughs> conference to exchange information on how not to use ozone-destroying chemicals. They could get out in six months to a year, all of them. Well, I, I think Congress should be asked to pass a law. Six months to a year, no more. Boom. Done. Uh, beyond that, we're going to have to continually monitor what the effects of what we have done are. I mean, how bad is the destruction? How bad is the effect on crops? The other, we talked about human beings and we talked about crops and plant life. There's the ocean food chain that's at risk as well. Oh, yeah. At the bottom of the ocean food chain is the phytoplankton and the zooplankton, little tiny microscopic creatures. They are destroyed or mutated by ultraviolet radiation. We've now discovered that ultraviolet radiation penetrates the ocean much deeper than we thought it did, up to 70 meters in some areas. If enough ultraviolet B mm. comes into the areas where the phytoplankton and zooplankton are generated, which is the polar regions, uh, you could, worst case, see the collapse of the ocean food chain. So we will have to continually monitor... Well, that would mean destruction of life on, on Earth, Earth. Uh, that's the basis of all food on Earth, the well, answer, isn't it? it? As I say, the Earth's been here for billions of years, and it has life tucked away in places that don't even depend on the sun. There are vents in the ocean floor where creatures survive by metabolizing sulfur. So the whole solar ecosystem Caves, could collapse yeah. and go away, <laughs> and those creatures would still be there. Um, it's part of our arrogance in some ways to, to say, well, gosh, you know, we might end up destroying human civilization. Human civilization on the planet Earth is a blink in the geologic time. Uh, if we go away, Earth will develop something else. Probably. I, being a human, would prefer that we not 
go away and that we take the steps that that doesn't happen species chauvinism yeah. no species chauvinism whatever <laughs> but uh i wouldn't mind that after i die i mean after that you die, you let it go well, that's right? the way the corporations think i pray new la deluge. De la deluge. You know, once we're finished who cares who cares that's um, it um actually this thing we're talking about now the ocean points to the international dimensions of this we indicated earlier that even if the u.s passed some laws about some of these uh, pollutants and chemicals not being used in industrial processes if they were used in other countries the problem would still be there so what is the role of the united nations in this or any international bodies obviously we're having an international earth summit so there is a consciousness among people that this yes. is an international problem that sure we start off locally with our own personal lifestyles and our communities and our countries but eventually we've got to think globally absolutely on this and what is the UN or any international bodies really done to deal with well, this? well it's, it's it's one of those the, the glass is half full or the glass is half empty depending on how you look at the glass of water the fact that we have had these major gatherings, the Montreal Protocols that set limits on ozone chemicals, the phase-out timetables for them, uh, is remarkable in human history. That all the nations of the world got together and reached an agreement on something like that was remarkable. The Earth Summit, from that same perspective, that all these heads of state are actually going there to sit there and talk about the Earth as, a, as an entity that needs to survive if we're going to survive, uh, is a, a giant step forward. The question is, what comes out of it? If what comes out of the Montreal Protocols is the year 2000 for phasing out ozone destroying chemicals, if what comes out of the Earth Summit is a greenhouse gas treaty with no deadlines, then, uh, well, is it half full or is it half empty? We had this great meeting and all these people came and nothing happened. Um, it's going to be a measure, the biodiversity treaty at the Earth Summit, that's another one that the U.S. is now going to refuse to sign, apparently. And that's Germany right. has said they are going to sign it, which I'm glad to see at least some of them are finally saying enough of this nonsense of, of kowtowing to the United States. We're going to do what we think needs to be done. I think more and more the pressure will build internationally to get the United States to stop being an outlaw. I mean, that's basically the position we're assuming, that we get to do whatever we want to do and we don't care what anybody else says. Uh, that it, it is one planet, people are realizing that, and that what we do affects other people, what other people do affects us. And you're getting the north-south split, the impoverished countries, the developing countries versus the rich countries, where the, the developing countries are saying, hey, you know, it's the rich people who have such a heavy footprint on the planet. They consume resources per capita way beyond anything we consume. Their contributions in greenhouse gases, their contributions in chlorofluorocarbons, uh, it's the rich countries that are destroying the planet. Yeah, we're cutting down our forests, and we're polluting our water, and we're overpopulating. Those are problems we have to deal with. But these are, in some senses, more in interim problems. You are taking steps that are so long-term. You know, what, are you going to cause another ice age? You're going to cause the collapse of the ozone layer? I mean, we're not doing anything like that. So let's talk about who's really the heaviest footprint on the planet and what can be done. And maybe we wouldn't have to destroy our forests if you would help us with some aid, um, you know, new crops. If, if we started growing uh, bamboo for paper or hemp for paper or any of those products that we're, we used to use for paper and stop cutting down the forest, it would change things radically. There are all those kinds of things that can be done and will be done on an international level within the United Nations, within other organizations, by non-governmental organizations cooperating together on exchanges of technology and ideas. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of like there's this, this cap on top of things called Bush and Group. You know, Bush and Associates, if we could just get that cap off, the creative energies that would be released of people trying to solve the problems and create a sustainable economy and do all that, I think could do it. But as long as we have this national security apparatus determined to control and dominate the planet through whatever means of manipulation, assassination, destabilization, whatever policy they want to follow, in our way, we can't get the job done. Now, it's not just Bush, it's the whole corporate system and the military system, yes. but it's his administration and the Reagan before them that were basically just serving their interests for yes. profitability and power and didn't give a damn about ecology or people's needs or anything else, really. And, and, and I don't leave the consumer out of it. It's the military, industrial, intelligence, consumer complex because we have to change our own individual patterns as well. And one way to change... Politically, the, the pattern is to take your money away from them. Don't buy their products. Do a consumer strike. De-consume. De 
and bring down their corporations, then they'll start to listen. Even if we were to begin tomorrow to do everything that needs to be done, however, and are ultimately successful in stopping the next ice age, the climate might still be increasingly severe for the next few years until some of the excess carbon dioxide can be taken out of the atmosphere and the greenhouse effect begins to subside. So we also need to begin stockpiling food, especially staple foods like grains and legumes, to get us through the next few years safely. The only way we can quickly build up worldwide food reserves enough is by remineralizing farm soils, which will bring much higher yields within a year or two. It will help if we stop feeding so much of our grains to cattle and other animals and reduce our meat eating for a while. We also need to quickly build as many solar greenhouses as possible. and use protective plastic coverings wherever they are needed to give our food crops additional protection against summer freezes, high winds, and hail. An attached solar greenhouse will also heat much of the house at the same time. But if we do not turn things around in time, we are not likely to have enough greenhouses or enough irrigation water for most of us to survive. And if there is less and less food to go around, we may start killing each other over it. So it seems like we'd better recognize very quickly what may well be happening and start as soon as possible to do everything we can to bring the greenhouse gases down to safe levels. Some people will say things like, if the ice age is coming, we shouldn't try to stop it. It's what nature intends. It's God's will. But maybe this ultimate crisis is a message from nature, or God, or the universe, or whatever you call the unknown that's bigger than we are, that it's time for us supposedly intelligent creatures to stop destroying this beautiful place we live. And if we get the message and act on it in time, we will perhaps have evolved to a higher level of consciousness. And maybe we'll be ready finally to coexist respectfully with our neighbors the countless other plant and animal beings we share this planet with. Have we got the guts to do it? How much do we really want to be here? And that's alternative views for this time. frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on alternative views and also a reading list for US power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these send a stamped self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network P.O. Box 7279 Austin, Texas 78713 You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We'd like to thank our crew people for helping make our program possible. Eric Eubank was our camera person and Kevin L. West was our audio man. Alternative Views is a presentation of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Goodbye.